without further ado, Joe Valerio. Joe, how you doing? I'm getting a little bit of a video issue here, but uh, hopefully <laughs> the audio is okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The the audio is great. So, uh, Joe, as I was introducing you, you know, former NFL lineman of the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, also St. Louis Rams. You played for Mario Schottenheimer, but you're also a local guy. Went to Ridley High School, uh, coached at Garnet Valley. So, how does this Eagles Chiefs Super Bowl? Uh, you know, what, what's the feeling right now? Well, it's, you know, I definitely have some, uh, some torn loyalties, you know, having grown up a, a huge Eagles fan and supporter my whole life growing up here in the Philadelphia area. Um, you know, a, a dream of mine was always, you know, as most football players in the Philadelphia area, wanted to play for the Eagles someday. And then I get shipped out to Kansas City, which it's funny because we used to call Kansas City like uh, Philadelphia West because there were so many connections, especially during my playing days out there in the 90s. Um, we had, you know, it started with Carl Peterson, who was with the Eagles and the Stars, and he brought out with him coaches and scouts the names of Herm Edwards, Carl Harrison, John Bunning, uh, Terry Bradway, Lynn Stiles, who was head of personnel. Uh, we had so many Philadelphia connections um, during those days. And then that just continued, right, with Coach Vermeil. And now Andy Reid and Nick Sirianni having spent some time there, like there's always been a connection, at least in the front office, and also with a lot of players too. You know, Bill Moss from Marple Newtown, Kevin Ross, Todd McNair, uh, you know, just a whole host of players that were from, you know, the Philadelphia area. So, so really cool connection. So my loyalties are, I'm going right down the middle, and I'm just going to say the team that's wearing a football helmet uh, this weekend is, is the one I'm rooting for. <laughs> That's a good way to go. So uh, I, I was talking to Tony Romo y yesterday, and he said the same thing. He goes, I'm not going to make a pick for you, but I'm going to tell you who the favorite is in this game. And he believes that the Eagles are just a bit above the Chiefs. So I, I kind of want to get your your feeling on that, Bill, in, in turn. I mean, the Bill. The, uh, see, I'm thinking Bill Moss already. Uh, there you Joe, go. Joe, Joe in, in, in terms of talent. Yeah, no, I, I think. I think these teams match up very well, position by position, right? When you look at every uh, group that's going to be out on the field matches up, I think special, all the way down to special teams. Um, you know, their defensive lines, both fantastic, uh, can rush the passer, know how to do a disciplined rush to, to keep people in the pocket. They've got, you know, up and coming defensive backs, you know, linebacking cores that are solid. So the defenses really match up well. You know, the offense, when you look at the offense, both of their offensive lines are, you know, you can argue either are the best in the, in the business. Um, you know, all of them always get ranked by, you know, the, the prognosticators as a top, at least a top three offensive line. You know, a diverse receiving core with different kinds of receiving, uh, you know, techniques, big receivers, feed, speedy receivers. So they've got matched up. The running backs, I think, are very similar. I think the big differentiator in this game, and I think the reason why the the Eagles are favored is besides some of the you know injuries that you know the the Chiefs are dealing with, you know, in the receiving core, Patrick Mahomes, you know, we'll see how the, his ankle heals up over the next two weeks. I believe it's at the quarterback position. And I think Jalen, what Jalen Hurts does with the RPO and his, you know, kind of being a a a, a triple threat, I think that's really what differentiates the Eagles and why they're probably favored. If I had to pinpoint, pinpoint it on one thing, not to say that Mahomes isn't magic, right? We all see what he does week in, week out, in the playoffs, coming back, no time left, do, making big plays on an injured leg. Um, it's, that, it's that thing that Jalen Hurts brings with the RPO that you watch the way that he just gashed you know, the 49ers with, with the, holding the linebackers and holding the safeties and making the defensive lineman stutter just a, just that hair um, and then it, not knowing what he's going to do with the ball and he can win with his legs, he can win with his arms. I think that's the differentiator, Jeff. I think if the Chiefs fans are looking for a way to win and the Chiefs organization is looking for a way to win, it's going to be how do you stop the RPO? And for the Eagles, it's how do you stop Patrick Mahomes and you keep him off the field and don't let him get into his you know magic man mode. So I think that's where both – teams have their work cut out for them it's 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 it stopping the quarterback i'm glad you brought that up too because when i had my conversation with romo yesterday he said you know i don't think anybody can stop the eagles offense in this 2022 season you're going to need a whole offseason to prepare because there's four different ways they could beat you and they can score on you and because of the quarterback and 
I kind of wanted to bring this up too to you. Is Jalen Hurts the best quarterback the Chiefs have faced all season? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they, and they play, they face some great ones, right? I mean, you know, you just look at what was going on within the, their own division, right? I mean, um, with Justin Herbert, and then you've obviously got Joe Burrow. They faced Josh Allen. So they faced quarterbacks that are good that, you know, you could put on par with Jalen as far as like being in the top echelon of quarterbacks. But I don't think they faced anybody like Jalen Hurts. You know, he's so smart. He's so good at what he does. And, 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 and that, that whole, you know, like, you know, that whole triple threat thing when he has the ball in his hands, right. He's either going to hand it off, he's going to run with it, or he's going to make a play. And, and I think they're doing it with, you know, obviously one of the best offensive lines in the NFL, right. I mean, up and down that you go from left tackle to right tackle. They're, you know, probably the, if not the best, one of the best that, that have, you know, that are existing at this point. And they're doing it with like, you know, look, I love Miles Sanders. I think Gain, Gainwell is fantastic, but it's not like it's Derrick Henry or Walter Payton or, you know, uh, any of the superstar running backs that you could think of back there uh, behind that Eagles offensive line. They're good. They're solid. Don't get me wrong. Same for the Chiefs. They don't they don't have a, a Jamal Charles or, you know, anybody like that, that that, uh, you know, is going to win a game on their back. Um, so. The, they, you know, the Eagles do it with scheme and they do it with Jalen Hurts's, you know, ability to run that offense. And and that's, I think, the most dangerous thing uh, for this Chiefs defense, that they're going to have to be really, really disciplined because they really haven't faced anything like that. You, you mentioned, you know, me coaching at Garnet Valley uh, High School out here in Delaware County. And, you know, we ran the triple option to to try to overcome uh, some of the things that we, you know, lack of size. We never, we were never the biggest offensive line. We never had the biggest running backs, but we always were able to win with scheme. And every time I watched the Eagles, it always kind of makes me smile thinking about my time coaching there because I loved coaching in the uh, in the triple option because it was so deceptive. And I I see a lot of that, you know, uh, with the Eagles and 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 the way that they can just get defensive linemen flat-footed they can hold linebackers and man once you can get them to do that you know you're obviously a step ahead we always talk about the Eagles offensive line how dominant they are but now let's go to the Chiefs offensive line they got some studs on that team Creed Humphrey Joe Dooney or Orlando Brown is this the best offensive line the Eagles pass rush is going to face all year yeah I think so I mean when I you know look at the Eagles schedule and who they played I mean they're just they're they're uh, they're a group that's come together. They're a revamped line, relatively revamped. It's nothing like you know. There's nobody on that line from the Super Bowl, uh, the last Super Bowl the Chiefs won. So which is interesting, right? That they've they're all new, all new. Uh, they're basically an all new group who had to come together, and they really have. Um, they've they've really what what Andy Reid does and what Eric Bieniemy does uh, as an offensive coordinator is they the Chiefs. Uh, team, when you look at them as an organization, as a coaching staff, they are never somebody who tries to, to to jam a square peg into a round hole. They are they are a team that they build their playbook around their players, and and that's why they're able to re bring in new players into the system and be effective. Right? You look at their all new receiving core, basically from that Super Bowl team when they made it to the Super Bowl last. You know they're. You know, obviously Patrick Mahomes and, and Travis Kelsey are are sort of the two constants on the offense. But what a Andy Reid does is he builds his offense around those players. And you look at the way that their their receiving core has adjusted to this playbook and the way that they've adjusted the playbook to this new, what I call diverse receiving core. Um, you know, of having a, a, a back shoulder guy, uh, you know, having the the Juju Smith is the possession type receiver still trying to get McCole Hardman and Kadarius Tony into that speed factor that they used to use Tyreek Tyreek Hill in. So they're they did the same thing. You know, I know I went off on a little tangent there, but they did the same thing with their offensive line. They built this offensive line to protect Patrick Mahomes to be a little bit more effective in the running game, and they've kind of done that this year, which is which is definitely so. To answer long answer to a short question, Jeff, they they have definitely. Um, uh, the Eagles have definitely not faced an offensive line that's going to be as effective as this one. One thing I was pounding the table for with this Chiefs team this year, and obviously you go on with Steven St. John and Nate Bikady, I've been telling them since August that the Chiefs are better. 
than they were last year. I thought they were way too dependent on Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey, and they were trying to get by with like a Byron Pringle and a Demarcus Robinson or a Miko Hardman as their wide receiver too. And they get Juju Smith-Schuster. They, you know, they draft Sky Moore. They get Marquez Valdez-Scantling. I, I thought they were just a deeper offense this year and overall a better team. And I don't think people realized it until they beat the Bengals in the AFC Championship game. No, you're absolutely right. That people were really doubting this whole thing. You know that the 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 shadow of Tyreek Hill was hanging over this team all year, right? Can they be the same offense without his speed and his playmaking ability? And I think they they really showed it in this game because in this Bengals game because look at the depth, right? Where were they at some point? You know when when Patrick, you know here he is on a hobbled leg throwing to third and fourth and fifth wide receivers. You know even Justin Watson, our local uh, pen. My Penn Quaker uh, fellow Quaker alum, uh, you know, they didn't even have him because he was sick. And, you know, he's been acting in that third and fourth and uh, role this year and, and they were without him. So, you know, it was it was it was a struggle, you know, for them to find their footing in this game against the Bengals. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, the depth of this receiving core is really coming through. And that's what I think they always needed myself. I, that's what I think they needed to really differentiate differentiate themselves and to bring the sort of playbook that Andy Reid has cooked up to bear was because they they were a one sort of a one trick pony with with Tyreek, right? It was all speed. I think the diversification of the wide receiving core was was a was a must. Just like I feel just like you did, Jeff. I think they needed to have uh, more options, and it's definitely given them more. Uh, more targets for for Patrick and and definitely opened up the playbook and added some pages uh, having a, you know some some supporting cast around around Travis Kelsey for sure. The Chiefs defense too. I think this has been their best defense since Steve Spagnuolo has been there. And now Nick Bolton's coming to his own. Uh, you know Trent McDuffie's been a good player for them. George Karloftis is coming to his own too in, in his rookie year. It just feels like this Chiefs defense could give the Eagles a challenge. Yeah, I mean they definitely they're they're they've. Coach Spagnola again just he espouses the same philosophy that Eric Bieniemy does on the offensive side. He he finds players that fit the fit the scheme, but he also fits the scheme to the players, and that and that's what I think you know good coaches should do, right? Because you don't want to just be that dictator coach that says, "Oh, you're going to fit into my system and you're going to play this way, and if you don't, you're on the bench." Like that's not the way this team operates. This team finds really good players, they find talent, and then. You know, they have an overarching philosophy, but they find a way to fit the playbook to the player. And they've done that with Karloftis. You know, they, I think a lot of people were expecting him to, you know, have a tremendous amount of sacks. And, you know, he started to come on towards the late, later part of the season. You know, Chris Jones, they put him in a role where he's playing a much more disciplined uh, role in this defense. You know, he's not, you know, he, he gets the sacks when he needs to get the sacks. Obviously, that big one he got against Burrow at the end of the yeah. game that really was, you know, one of the differentiators on that last drive to give the Chiefs the ball back um, to to be able to go ahead for the go ahead win. But what they're what they're doing, I think, what Eagles fans and and Eagles people who follow the Eagles should look at is the way that the Chiefs play very disciplined on defense. They don't create a lot of lanes. And that's the one thing they're going to have to really do with Jalen Hurts is they can't give him any pockets within the pocket. And that's something, you know, a thing I talk about a lot. And that's something Patrick Mahomes is really good at. So if you flip it back for the Eagles defense, they're going to have to do the same thing. You know, the old traditional pass rush, Jeff, of, you know, what I call like a, you know, like a parabola for all you geometry, you know, fans out there or, you know, uh, like what you would it'd be like a half of an oval, right? When you think about the typical normal pass rush of your two defensive ends coming around the outside and your two defensive tackles trying to blast their way up the middle. Well, with the new wave quarterback that's out there, it's really difficult to to stop this new kind of quarterback who has a really uncanny way of finding the pocket within the pocket. Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Patrick Mahomes. Justin Herbert, when you watch them week in and week out, they are so good at finding the pocket within the pocket and giving the receivers that one extra step and second to get open. That's not your traditional drop back quarterback mentality, right? When you go back to the old school, John Elway's, you know, the Dan Marino's, you know, the, 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 the statuesque drop back quarterbacks that just kind of sit back there. This new quarterback knows how to use their legs. And they're taking advantage of, you know, 
uh, the roughing calls and you're taking advantage of it. So they're hanging in the pocket a little bit longer. And, and, and I think, you know, what the Eagles are going to have to do and what the chief defensive front is going to have to do is play very, very disciplined and actually not go for the sack, go for the pressure, you know, go collapse the pocket in a very disciplined, you know, methodical way rather than trying to, you know, make make it happen too fast. So something for, for your listeners and fans to watch, I think, from an offensive line p- play perspective is, and a defensive line play is, watch how the pass rush is. And if the pass rush gets too undisciplined and too chaotic, you watch what these quarterbacks like Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes can do. They'll shred you um, if, you're, if you don't stay disciplined. You got to kind of, I call it, <laughs> there's a little term I, we've been talking about, we call it a mush rush. You got to kind of have to like move, move the defensive line in a very methodical way and just mush the quarterback as opposed to going after the big sack. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned today's quarterback to a quarterback 20 years ago. So I watch a lot of old NFL games, and I guess they're considered old now. 2001 is 20 years ago, but I'm watching the Eagles-Rams game from there. And Jim Johnson sending Troy Vincent, Bobby Taylor after Kurt Warner, and he's disguising the blitzes with safeties on there. I'm like, he could never get away with that today because the, the ear, A, the quarterback would take off, or B, he'd get rid of the ball quicker. It, it's such a different, more fast-paced game than it was back in the day when you played. Yeah, I'm glad you recognized that, Jeff, and that's very astute and insightful because the game has changed. And I think, you know, defenses have probably had to keep up with offenses more than vice versa. You know, I think the defensive game uh, has become what I would call the, um, you know, where you've got to make your adjustments, so to speak. You know, offensively, they're the they're the that's the position group that's moving at 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 a rapid pace from a development perspective. I think defenses have had to adjust, as opposed to you know years ago when you look back to the Buddy Ryan era of the Eagles, the forty six defense. You look at you know defenses adjusting more. They've had to adjust more to this sort of what I call the you know the four two five right. They've had to use bigger, stronger safeties to act as your linebacker as opposed to having the three bruising linebackers in there right. Where you know you go back to those old you know four three or even sometimes the four four defense right. You saw the not that long ago you saw a four four defense in the NFL where you had two Mike linebackers and two outside linebackers, four big defensive linemen and three defensive backs. Those days are gone. And and I think, you know, I guess in a roundabout way, what I was trying to say is defenses have had to adjust much more over the last 10 to 15 years to the way offense is progressing as opposed to vice versa, because def- offense is moving at a much more rapid pace than 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 the defense is from, you know, from a scheme perspective. So, you know, that's going to be another thing that, you know, fans are going to have to watch in this game or how are these defenses going to adjust you know, not having seen each other this year, you know, what, how much film can you digest in two weeks to get yourself a game plan that could stop either of these offenses and practice it enough too, right? I mean, you can't just, you don't just watch the film, you know, you, you have to go out and practice these things. There's, there's some muscle memory to stopping the RPO. You know, if you've never seen it before, you're gonna have to go out and rep it. So the Chiefs are gonna have to come up with a good Jalen Hurts quarterback, um, you know, for their scout team. Because that's something that's very important that a lot of fans don't really think about. They don't they don't think about the preparation that goes in from a scouting perspective during the week. And 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 we used to call it, you know, running the cards. Because what we would do, Jeff, is, you know, the offense that was running scout, right? So the Chiefs offense, the backups that are going to be acting as the Eagles this next two weeks, you know, you're going to be they're going to be looking at cards, right? They're going to have cards drawn up on Eagles plays. You know, and they're going to say, OK, guys, it's third and 10. Here's the Eagles offense. So, you know, OK, so and so you're acting as Jalen Hurts. Put the number one, you know, penny on and you're going to be, you know, Miles Sanders and you're going to be this player. And you have to you have to give your defense a good look and vice versa. You know, for the defense, you got to give your offense a good look. But that's going to be really important for these two teams. Who are the Eagles going to get to replicate Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and what they can do? And who are the Chiefs going to get to, you know, to replicate Jalen Hurts and Antonio Brown and, and and what those guys are going to do on the field? That's going to be just as important as watching the film and, you know, coming up with the game plan. It's going to be it's going to be finding players that can act 
like the other team so that you can get a really good scout look. And so, you know, just a little insight that I wanted to share with you that's going to be really important for for these two teams over the next two weeks. That's what's going to make this a fun Super Bowl, in my opinion. I, another thing is, I know people, I guess Eagles fans are over Andy Reid. It's been over a decade, but he's been, I, I can't believe it, honestly. He's been better in Kansas City. I knew he'd be successful there. I figured he'd get a Super Bowl at some point just because he's a really good coach, but it's kind of crazy how he's better with the Chiefs than he was with the Eagles, yet I'm still seeing the same coach, the same tendencies. And I mean, he's improved on some stuff, but his players still love him. Every Chiefs player I talk to loves Big Red, loves Andy Reid. It's, I, I just don't see a change in the guy. It's it's the same Andy Reid. It's just he brought what he learned from Philadelphia over uh, down to Kansas City. Yeah, no, it's a great, great point, Jeff. And, and you know, and listen, he's he's got Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, too. You know, that's the talent is, you know, you can't substitute just having players that can make things happen. And and I think he's again, good coaches find ways to get those players to be the most successful. I mean, you know, look at Bill Belichick. I mean, he's still Bill Belichick and the Patriots are struggling, you know, without Tom Brady and without some of the tools that he had, um, you know, so. You know, coaches coaches put themselves into a into a different stratosphere when they're coaches like Andy Reid, right? They're they're coaches that and Bill the Bill Belichicks of the world, and you know they, they they can certainly they have the talent themselves to be able to build a team and to to have a certain philosophy. But at the end of the day, you know you got to have the players too, right? You got to have the talent to match it. And great coaches marry those two things together. And, and yeah, I mean, Andy Reid looms large, right? He's, he's, he's a larger than life presence. He, he had a great run in Philadelphia. I think he, the fans, you know, really appreciated his, you know, uh, the respect that he uh, gains by the respect he gives, you know, he gives the fans respect. He gives the other teams respect. And that's what I'm expecting out of this game, Jeff, because of Andy Reid um, and, 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 and the Kelsey brothers, I'm expecting a game that's going to be too fantastic football teams, right? We're down to the two number one seeds, right? Which awesome to see, right? That the best are going to be playing against the best from each conference. But I think these are two teams that, listen, their fan bases love their teams and they're going to defend their team. And they're going to say, they're going to go out there. The fan base is going to go out with the utmost confidence that their team is going to win. There's a lot of Chiefs fans that are saying, yes, we are, as the Chiefs are going to win the Super Bowl. And there are Eagles fans that are out there saying, yes, we are going to win the Super Bowl. And I love that. You want your fans to have that confidence in your team and to, you know, and to really be, be vocal about, about your team winning. But what I think as gritty as, you know, Philadelphia fans are, uh, and I know it living here my whole life, being a Philadelphia Eagles fan my whole life and continuing to this day. And, and I always considered myself one of those types of players, you know, trying to be gritty. Um, you know, listen, I mean, the Flyers mascot's name is Gritty. Come on. So, and and that's something that the, the, the Chiefs fans are going to have to get used to, right? They're going to have to get used to. But but at the same time, Eagles fans are utmost respectful of teams that do things the right way. And I think that I think the Eagles fans are going to have a great amount of respect for this team because the Chiefs don't talk trash. Yeah, you get a slip here and there where a player might say something, put a little bulletin board material up. But these are two very respectful organizations, um, and I think I think it's going to be a heavyweight battle, right? It's going to be a, a heavyweight slugfest that's going to happen on the field. This game is not going to be won in, on Twitter, or it's not going to be won in social media, or on you know the meet in the media outlets. I think these teams are going to go into this game, and the fans too are going to go into this game really looking forward to a great game with two really great teams who both deserve to be in the Super Bowl. So that I'm actually looking forward to because, you know, the whole thing with the Bengals and the Chiefs just got really old, right? With the mayor of Cincinnati talking trash. And then, you know, that did nothing for the Bengals. None of that trash talk, the Burrowhead stuff. Like you're not going to hear that stuff out of the Eagles fans. You're not going to hear that stuff out of the, out of the Eagles players. Um, as gritty as we are and as tough as we are and as confident as we are as Philadelphia fans, you're not just going to get that kind of just empty trash talk. And I'm actually excited about that. So I think it's going to make for a really, a really eventful Super Bowl that way, um, rather than, you know, like I said, winning this game, you know, in the locker room or on social media. 
Yeah, finally, Joe, uh, I'm glad you brought up, like, the passion of the Eagles fans, the passion of the Chiefs fans. They both have had long championship droughts. Chiefs went 50 years, the Eagles went 57. They finally got their championship now. I, I feel like Chiefs fans and Eagles fans can really relate. And you know, just from playing in Kansas City, how starving that franchise was for a championship, knowing how close you guys were under the Schottenheimer years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... It- there, there's a lot of mirrors here, right? Think about, think about the, 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 the correlations you're drawing there, Jeff, as far as how the, you know, there was that long drought, but with good teams, right? Good teams. I mean, you know, the, you know, the Chiefs had had some bad decades too, just like the Eagles did. I mean, during the during the droughts, um, but but towards the '90s, you know, and and and, and into the 2000s, teams were both those teams were good, always a top ten team, top eight team. You know, going to the deep into the playoffs or or making the playoffs almost every year. You know, with like you you make the parallels between Andy Reid at, in Philadelphia and Marty Schottenheimer and Dick Vermeil in in Kansas City. And but that we just no, they couldn't get over the hump. Like there was that the the, the, the Lombardi <laughs> Trophy was just within everybody's grasp. And then and then just around the same time, both teams get one right, like within a couple of years of each other. So yeah, a lot of parallels. And I think what 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 the fans in both cities now have come to realize is that they're hungry for more. Now that they got a taste of that one Super Bowl in this decade, you know, the 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 Eagles fans and the Chiefs fans want another one. And so do the players, right? And so so do the ownership. So they're they're getting into that feeling of like dynasty mode now. All right, we won one, we got to get another. You know, we won it. Now we got to keep going. So, yeah, I think it's it's just so besides all of the the parallels between the Chiefs and the Eagles from a personnel and coaching and player perspective and, the, and that sort of deep connection. There's also that connection, Jeff, of, of, of having that championship DNA within the last several years and wanting more. So, yeah, a lot of parallels between, you know, this Midwestern sleepy little town of Kansas City and the big booming metropolis of Philadelphia. Even though they might be different in geography, I think there's a lot more similarities than differences in these two franchises for sure. Joe Valerio, the pride of Ridley High School, the pride of the University of Pennsylvania. Will you be down at the Super Bowl next week? I, I won't be, Jeff. We're going to be having a, a big family blowout here, you know, bringing all of our Eagles and Chiefs uh, thoughts together for, for Super Bowl <laughs> Sunday. Uh, so we're going to we're going to celebrate here in Philadelphia uh, watching the game. And, um, you know, I, I would love I would love to be there, but uh uh, it'll be great to be here with all of our family who've watched these two franchises in, in different ways, right? We're all Eagles fans because we all live here and we love this team. But, you know, a lot of us uh, have a special place in our heart for the Chiefs, too, because of our time there. So it's going to be a lot of fun to watch those two teams uh, battle. Um, I'm, just one last closing thing. my One of my all-time favorite memories, Jeff, was, was in 1992, seeing those Eagles helmets come out of the tunnel at Arrowhead and thinking to myself, man, you know, that's my boyhood team, man. That's it right there. I, I really felt like I had made it in the NFL when I saw those winged helmets come out of, of, of Arrowhead's tunnel. And it really does mean a lot for me. And one last funny story, if we got a second, Jeff. Um, we got time. After, after after I got drafted by the Chiefs um, in 1991, I ran, I ran into Harry Gamble, who was a former Penn coach and was at the time the general manager of the Eagles. And I, I ran into him at the Maxwell Club Awards. and he came up to me and he said, "Hey Joe, congratulations on going to the to the Chiefs. You're going to love it there. Carl Peterson is a dear friend. I love the Hunt family. You really are in good hands going out there." And he said, "By the way, just to let you know, if the Chiefs hadn't taken you, you were our next pick." And I was like, "Oh, Mr. Gamble, why did you have to tell me that? Because <laughs> that just broke my heart that I there was the possibility that I could have been a Philadelphia Eagle if uh, if the Chiefs hadn't." Uh, hadn't snatched me up one one round sooner. So uh, I always think about that when I think about my uh, my time in Kansas City and what could have been in Philadelphia. But, you know, super excited. Hey, Jeff, thanks for having me on. This was awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hope uh, we can do this again sometime. Absolutely, Joe. I'd love to have you on. Uh, it was great Eagles Chiefs connection. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I'm the same way as you are. I I don't really care who wins the game. I, I, I've – I don't think I've missed the Chiefs game since Andy Reid became the coach. So that's that's just what Andy Reid has meant to me growing up, you know, as an Eagles fan and what he's been able to do with that franchise and, you know, covering the Eagles. It's just an awesome time. I can't wait for this game. 
Yeah. And then and putting a plug in for, for ocean uh, casino and resort. I'm uh, excited about Chaz Palminteri coming to do his one man uh, soliloquy of, of a Bronx tale and, and re uh, you know, reinvigorating that show at, at, uh, at ocean. So, which that's really exciting. So can't wait to make my way down there and see that I'm a big fan. All right. Sounds great. Thanks for coming on Joe. I appreciate All right, it. Jeff, we'll talk to you soon, bud. All right.